Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Peter Evans, uh, Senior Business Correspondent at the Sunday Times. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining and thanks to the CPS for producing such an interesting and provocative report. Um, I think it challenges some of the assumptions a lot of people have about the relationship between big tech and small business. Uh, so we'll go into that in some detail um, in the next hour. One thing that did strike me uh, was how over the past three months, according to the, the SME decision makers who responded, these digital platforms have in some cases helped them survive during what's been um, a total economic shutout. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that and a lot more. One statistic that always jumps out at me whenever I read uh, stuff on SMEs or write stuff on SMEs is that uh, they make up 99.8% of all businesses in Britain. Uh, so we should be talking about them all the time in relation to every policy decision made when we're talking about business, but we're not in some cases. Uh, that is changing and hopefully we can change a bit of that today, but um, almost every single business decision has impact on SMEs. Um, right, uh, we've got a great set of panelists today and uh, and a presentation on the report. So I'll quickly introduce you and then hand over to Eamon Ives from the CPS who will run you through some of the findings. So we have Paul Scully, the um, Small Business Minister, uh, Karen Pallant, the UK Policy Manager at Facebook, uh, Venus Ali, Director of Policy at Tech UK and Nick King, Head of Business at CPS. Um, we'll come to panel discussion shortly, but uh, first off, Eamon, over to you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, very flattering to have such an impressive lineup of guests here, uh, not least the Minister, who I hope um, will find the following discussion interesting and useful. Um, so as you we were saying, sort of before we open up into a general discussion, I'm just going to take a few minutes uh, sort of through the broad contours of our report. Um, so when we first started this research, I think we were focused mainly on looking into one key economic problem, and that's the UK's productivity puzzle, um, particularly within smaller businesses. Um, now, productivity is important because it essentially means how much stuff we can produce with any given amount of resources. Um, so the more we make, the higher our living standards will be or should be. Um, in fact, in the long run, increasing productivity is pretty much the only real way to genuinely lift living standards. So it's critical that we keep it trundling along at at least a decent pace. Um, and sadly for the UK, that's really not been the case of late. So many of you may know that the um, rate of productivity growth in the UK has been pretty abysmal since the financial crash uh, between 2008 and the end of the 2010s. It's grown by a, a measly 0.3% per annum. Uh, and that's in stark contrast to the reasonably healthy 2.3% uh, or so um, in the three decades uh, prior. And that represents a massive opportunity cost. Um, in fact, if productivity had stayed um, on that sort of pre-crash trend, we believe that it would be about 25% higher uh, than it is today. So clearly a, a huge uh, gap there. Um, it's also worth noting how the UK productivity figures compare with other nations, um, which to be blunt is not very well. The UK does have a slightly higher than average um, productivity rate than um, the average OECD country, but we're still a long way off leading uh, nations like Ireland, uh, USA, France, Germany. Um, so that was kind of where we, we first envisaged the report um, looking at, but quite obviously there's um, been a lot of change since then, not least in the form of the economic fallout from COVID-19, um, which we've all had to contend with. Uh, not least small businesses. Um, and we already kind of know the damage that that's wrecking uh, on the economy, uh, despite the government's best efforts through things like the furlough scheme and other measures. Um, so clearly COVID-19 and the productivity growth challenge are two huge problems for the UK. Um, they're not gonna be solved by any single intervention or development, um, however much we, we may wish they would be. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't tools which we can reach for to help and one of those tools is uh, greater digitization among businesses. So how much businesses are using new uh, and novel digital technologies. So that's kind of um, where we started the research and the sort of the context that we, we like to badge it in. Um, so right now we're probably realizing more than ever just how important digital, digital technologies are to our everyday lives. 
um, but particularly our, wor our work lives. So without Zoom, for instance, um, this webinar wouldn't be possible. Um, and in fact, Zoom's you know, a real good example of how um, digitization is impacting the workplace and exactly the sort of thing that we, we wanted to learn more about in our research. Um, so looking at small businesses in particular, we were kind of focused on three key areas. Um, firstly, how digital technologies are impacting um, advertising, uh, how they're impacting sales, and how they're impacting sort of the back-end operations really within small businesses. Um, so let's start with advertising. So this is clearly a massive, uh, massively important part of business. Um, and the eye-watering sums of money which are spent on advertising each year are perhaps the best testimony to that. Um, and perhaps by virtue of those um, large sums, advertising is really uh, held up as one of those cliche barriers to entry. Um, it prevents smaller firms from competing with bigger ones as effectively as we might want them to, um, because they simply can't afford to shell out on expensive ad campaigns uh, like a big retailer might. Um, digital advertising, however, poses an interesting question here, because not only has digital advertising brought the costs down of um, advertising in general, studies also suggest that it's actually more effective than advertising in, say, print or television. So one study, I think from last year, found that um, three dollars of digital advertising in the USA had around about the same effect as five dollars of print advertising. So there's, uh, a, there's a win there in terms of falling costs which bring advertising within reach for smaller businesses but also the fact that it's, it's generally more effective um, in the sort of the bang for buck that you get from it. Um, but we found that digital technologies help in another way here. So specifically platforms like Facebook or Twitter um, or Instagram, um, they can sort of harness the data of their users um, and allow firms taking out digital ads to really target who they want to get to. Um, and essentially that means that firms aren't wasting money putting adverts in front of people who probably have no interest in buying the product um, at all. So, um, so that's another way in which um, digital technologies are helping. But beyond that, there are even other ways. So things like social media would be a classic example of where um, firms can effectively advertise in all but name um, and effectively at zero cost. So for instance, if you set up an Instagram account, um, maybe you're like a bakery or something like that, you can um, amass a, a following of users um, who follow your content, push stuff out to them, um, at showing your product. And I think we'd all agree that that's basically advertising just for free. Um, now, of course, the purpose of advertising is to get us to buy stuff. And that's another area where digital technologies are revolutionizing um, the world of e-commerce and things like that, arguably to smaller businesses' advantage. So we found that the value of e-commerce sales has really rocketed over the last decade, up by around about 60% um, compared to 2009 figures. Um, so we now spend just shy of 700 million pounds uh, each year buying things online. Um, and if my lockdown Amazon habits are anything to go by, that's certainly going to be a lot higher this year. Um, so where small businesses do well out of the rise of e-commerce is that it sort of breaks down another key barrier to entry. So since the internet has come along, having a defined physical presence on the high street or perhaps in a shopping center is not quite the, uh, the must have that it once was for a small business. Um, I'm sure the minister knows full well about how expensive retail space could be. Um, but the internet really allows some businesses to forgo all that. So nowadays a small firm might find they can operate just as effectively um, out of a home office, maybe with some warehousing nearby. Um, and that should be welcomed because like we say, it's sort of breaking down one of those barriers to entry, which um, reduce competition. And lastly, we, we turned our attention on how digitization is changing sort of the, the nature of the back end business operations, the stuff that sort of goes on behind closed doors away from the customer. Um, probably the least sexy of the three things, but still very important nonetheless. So here we're talking about how things like computer systems are helping small businesses automate things, um, how they can make them more agile, stay on top of their work better. Um, speaking from experience, I don't think I'd have managed half as well during lockdown without things like Trello or Slack to keep in touch with my colleagues um, and sort of up to speed with what they're doing. Um, and that's sort of something we found through polling and focus groups definitely replicated across um, many small businesses in the UK. Um, we're also talking about uh, things such as digital accounting here, um, which perhaps speeds up boring administrative tasks like paying taxes um, and helping to overcome things like late payments, which is obviously a scourge for many small businesses in the UK. 
And fundamentally, a lot of these sort of digitization trends we found uh, really allow businesses to focus on what they do best rather than spending hours and hours laboring over forms or bureaucracy or doing things manually. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of the three kind of key areas where we were keen to look at in this report. Um, but we also talk about other things. So we talk about how novel digital platforms are really allowing um, the creation of a new wave of entrepreneurship, um, as well as looking at just how important the digital sector is for the UK, uh, not least in terms of the jobs, the ads, the value to the economy, and so forth. Um, so perhaps I'll touch upon some of those later, but I think um, conscious of just how many good speakers we have to hear from still, um, I'll, I'll leave it there for now and um, hopefully come back to some of that later. Great. Thanks, Eamon. Um, now, could I introduce Paul Scully, who's the Minister for Small Business, for some opening remarks? Thank you very much, Peter, and, and thanks, uh, Nick, and everybody else for the invitation to, uh, to speak to you today and producing the, uh, the, the, the report on how big technology companies can work with SMEs and the wider digital skills agenda. It's going to be a huge, huge part of the SME recovery. We know how incredibly hard it is for SMEs um, at this particular time. It's clear that the UK economy is going to face significant challenges because of COVID-19 and the economic landscape is going to look very, very different. What I've been uh, doing over the few weeks uh, that I've been a minister, it seems like a long time uh, because of the situation, is speaking to the um, SMEs, speaking to the retail sector, to the hospitality sector. And if we just go back to the last general election, we talked about two things with business in terms of business, in particular in my, in my area. One was to make sure that the UK was the best place in the world to start, to scale up, to grow uh, a small business. Um, and beyond that, I want to make sure I go further. I don't care where you are in the UK, you should be able to, you still should be the best place to do all of those different things. And obviously digital um, equality around, those, around the regions is going to be so important to make that happen. Uh, but we also talked about the um, employment bill that we're going to be uh, bringing in front of Parliament uh, soon, which uh, the, at the middle of that is all about making flexible working uh, the default option for people um, where, where, wherever possible. And clearly, this is one of those conversations of many that have been accelerated because of the situation that, we've, uh, that we, we find ourselves in. So in terms of the, the negatives that we have to face the challenges, it's the future of our high streets. In terms of the positive, it's flexible working and digital uh, take up. But ironically, digital um, technology and uh, the internet in particular and, and apps around the internet have, um, have ex probably accelerated the decline of the high street in many ways. But it, the, ironically, it has a major role to play in saving the high street, in, in, in that new guise, that new reality, uh, when we have the permanent behaviour changes that sit behind the, the, the new normal at the moment. So you've got the new normal of social distancing, but you've got the new reality that's coming up soon about permanent behaviour changes where people are going to be working from, the more flexible working, which is going to take that uh, um, office HQ uh, lunchtime economy from independent sandwich shops, for example, coffee shops and the like. Uh, and the, the, um, the fact that fewer people are using cash at the moment because of the, uh, um, the rise of contactless payments throughout, um, through, for hygiene reasons. So all of these things have a massive uh, digital um, aspect to them that we, that we need to work on. Uh, Eamon talked about late, pay late payments, and this is, uh, this is a massive area that we need to continue to work on for small businesses because cash flow is absolutely everything for small businesses. Um, and one of the interesting conversations I had with one of the, um, uh, the, the, the main accounting software companies is that because they now work and everything's in the cloud for them, they can actually look at the anonymized data um, uh, through their, um, their, 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 their go through their service, so they can see how late payments have been affected and sort of lengthened and, and, and shrunk over, over any given time. So they can see exactly how um, big businesses, in general, not in specifics, but in general, are behaving towards smaller companies. And clearly, um, payments have been getting later um, over the last few weeks. So it's something that we can work with technology companies to really get that rich data so that we can come up with um, solutions uh, for those kind of issues. 
And I think what digital uh, and the general uptake of technology allows us to do is what I hope is going to be the business word of 2021. So 2020, clearly the business word is going to be furlough. But 2021, I hope it's going to be pivot. Because what we're seeing at the moment is a number of um, companies that are either finding new opportunities or they're quickly realizing that their business model at the moment uh, isn't going to go back to, there is no light switch moment for them to go back to how things were in January or February. They realize they've got to shift a little um, to, to, uh, to be able to not just survive, but thrive uh, with given, given um, op opportunities. And there's some great examples uh, of where that is absolutely happening. But I go back to being able to grow and, uh, and scale up and, and, uh, and, and, and initially start a business. Government has a role to create the environment for that. We're not wealth creators, we're not job creators. That's, that is small businesses, that's that, that's that 98, 99.8% of the business community has even said. We've got to make sure that they can, we can tackle the issues that hold back competitiveness and the productivity, as you've said, of UK firms. Making sure that we can deliver on the business productivity review and open up entrepreneurship to more female, young and black and ethnic minority entrepreneurs. And as I say, tackling the damage practice of, uh, damaging practices of late payments to small businesses. But your report has shown that digital skills are often key to an SME's continued success. But we've also found that strong leadership and management practices are strongly correlated to, to, to increasing um, productivity, to a firm's level of productivity, with even small improvements that link to productivity gains. So the adoption of even basic technologies can lead to productivity uh, improvements of between 7% and 18%. And if two or more business management te technologies are employed, that rises to 25%. But whilst UK adoption rates are rising, they're still low when compared internationally. So we want to build a world-leading world digital economy that works for absolutely everyone, which means ensuring as many people as possible can reap the benefits of being online and the technologies that can transform our lives, benefit society, and drive prosperity and growth. So for individuals, that can lead to financial employment, health, and social benefits. And for businesses, it can re result in increased digital marketing and trading opportunities. And for government, that means more people are able to use digital services. So we know there's a high demand for digital skills across the country, with um, uh, the DM DCMS commissioned Burning Glass report of 2019, which demonstrated that at least 82% of advertising openings require some level of digital skills. Data skills were predicted to be the fastest growing digital skills cluster over the next five years. The uh, Department of Education's Employer Skills Survey in 2017 showed that approximately 73,000 skills shortage vacancies in the UK were attributed, at least in part, to a lack of digital skills. That represents 33% of all UK skills shortage vacancies. And that significant lack of digital skills includes basic computer literacy involved in 50,000 of skills shortage vacancies, 23% of all of those vacancies, as well as advanced and specialist IT skills, which is about 46,000 skills shortage vac vacancies, or 20, 21%. So there's so much we can do, more that we can do. That same survey showed that employers struggled to fill 26% of vacancies in the digital sector due to applicants lacking the right skills, which compares to 22% of vacancies in all UK sectors. So your report is really welcome uh, in in, in spurring, on the, spurring on this debate, making sure that it gets lifted off the page and absolutely brought in, not just to government thinking, but importantly to SMEs who can then learn the lessons and work closely with uh, big technology companies as well, because that close working relationship is gonna benefit both of those, um, the, those types of companies and therefore the UK economy as a whole. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, before we uh, move on and, and ask the panelists to, to introduce themselves, I should have said earlier, please do um, ask some questions. You should have an option uh, on the toolbar at the bottom to ask, ask some questions and we'll do that in a few minutes, but uh, either specify who you'd like to ask them to or, or come up with a general one and we'll, we'll try to get through them all. Um, anyway, right, so uh, just to start off with a few uh, introductory remarks for each panelist, let's go to Karen, please, from Facebook. 
Hi, thank you uh, very much, Peter, and um, thank you to uh, thank you, Minister, and for your remarks and for the um, really thoughtful contribution around the, the impact of digital for for business in, in the UK, um, and to, 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 to aim for a fantastic report. Um, we, we were delighted to support the work of the Centre for Policy Studies and, and Eamon's work in, in, in producing this report. Um, it's a hugely important uh, moment for um, business in, in the UK, for digital in the UK. Um, the, um, the, the, at the moment, obviously, digital for business is, 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 is becoming a, a ever more important as a result of the crisis that we face. But more broadly, um, as a, a very significant number of regulatory uh, and, and, and policy changes uh, happen in the UK, over, 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 have been proposed over the last year, two years, three years, and, and, and are coming forwards um, with the goal of meeting some of the societal concerns about the impact of changing technology. It's absolutely vital that we that, are, that we a report like this um, helps us helps the policy maker community more widely understand the, the behind the headlines, uh, the impact that tech has on our economy. Um, and I, 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 I want to cite the DCMS who pointed out that online advertising, for example, ranks, is an important and growing contribution to our economy. The UK market is now the third largest in the world. So that is an area where you know, digital, di digital adoption in the UK, we are in fact leading the world. Um, over 2 million businesses in the UK have uh, a Facebook presence. Um, the vast majority only use our free services, um, the kinds that Eamon talked about, a Facebook page, um, an Instagram profile, those kinds of things. Um, the, uh, we, we are major investors in London, um, over uh, 3,000 at the start of this year, we're hoping to have 4,000 staff in London by the end of the year, with space for 6,000 next year opening. Um, and, and this report is a really valuable reminder of why getting policy air in this area is so crucial. Just a few years ago, advertising wasn't an option for many businesses, as, as Eamon talked about. It was too expensive, too broadly targeted, too cost, to, to be cost, effect, cost effective. Now advertisers can use uh, our free tools, as I talked about, or simple affordable, affordable advertising that breaks down barriers to entry, not just for smaller businesses into markets dominated by larger businesses, but some of the types of businesses that the minister talked about, women entrepreneurs, BME entrepreneurs, a broader range of businesses can now enter those, those markets. SMEs can compete and challenge with much larger big businesses much more effectively. And when we know that, um, and, and this goes to the point that the minister made, that we know that when businesses in the UK grow, Facebook grows, it is clearly the case that um, in some areas and in some markets, platforms and smaller businesses may well be in competition and there may be an impact on the high street. We're really robust about the fact that actually we, we believe that we make a positive contribution uh, to the fact that small businesses on the high street can reach their local customers and let them know about what's going on much more effectively than they could before. So actually we, we, we believe that, 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 that the relationship is much more symbiotic um, than that. Now, it's clearly not universally the case, but um, for, for for every platform and every high street. But that's not, that's that's where we believe we stand. And right now, we know that um, with the crisis that's uh, facing our, our society and the health crisis and our economy, we know that businesses of all sizes are being forced to adapt. Uh, and so we've accelerated some of our um, efforts to, to support businesses through the crisis and some of the tools that, that we provide to businesses. So we've, we're building a tool called Facebook Shops, for example, which is a, a, a way that businesses that have, have an online presence, that have a community of customers that they speak to regularly online, can now more, cl more closely integrate their, um, the, the buying experience for, for, for those customers. Um, and, and, and what's amazing about that is that because the UK is such a leading part, part of the, the, the global e-commerce market, we're building that tool here in London. We're expanding our engineer, our ads engineering team here in London to do that work. So it's, it's, it's both a strength in tech and in digital marketing that's really driving that investment in the UK. Um, we know that, um, and we also wanted to, to offer, use our platform to, to reach and support a lot of businesses during the crisis. So over April and May, we held sessions with Be The Business, an NGO that I know the Minister will be very familiar with. Uh, we reached hundreds of businesses with advice and support, and our business resource centre that we built has reached millions of businesses in the UK, supporting them to access government advice and help and support. We're now rolling that out with Be The Business. We aim to engage a quarter of a million businesses in the UK in the next 12 months on our 
our platform and more widely with an automated messenger bot um, and with peer-to-peer -peer support on Facebook through Facebook groups. We know, as the minister talked about and, 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 and as Eamon talked about, that UK businesses have in some areas been slow to adopt technology. We also know that when it comes to social media and digital marketing, that they've been that, that they lead the world in many ways. And the, the small business tech adoption of the kind of tech we offer, which is consumer facing, simple, accessible, is the kind of tech that, that UK businesses do adopt. And therefore we wanna use our platform to spread the tech adoption amongst, amongst small businesses, working with partners like Big Business and using the evidence base of this fantastic report to back that work up um, and really to, to help um, play our part in, in building a recovery here in the UK. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, next to Venus, I think. Um, a couple thank of you very much, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Um, and thank you to CPS um, for inviting me to join this discussion. I don't think um, you could have had a more timely report on the eve eve of the Chancellor's um, statement on Wednesday. Um, so just very quickly, why are Tech UK involved in this conversation and who are we? Um, we are the industry body for the UK's technology sector. We represent over 850 member companies um, like Facebook, but about two thirds of our membership are small businesses. And we shouldn't forget that actually the tech space itself is full of startups and, um, and small businesses that are really keeping the UK at the very cutting edge. And the tech sector, uh, like Facebook, has, um, has, is a really good example of just how quickly it's pivoted to support small businesses and high streets and, and local communities um, in the face of the crisis. Um, so, I mean, Tech UK has been working on the issue of digitization and adoption for many years now. I think, as Eamon said, um, you know, we've been struggling with this productivity puzzle for over a decade since the financial crash of 2008. Um, and it's formed a central pillar of uh, our conversations with government, with the minister and his colleagues, uh, with DCMS, and of course, with Treasury as well. Um, and so really now that the, there is a big debate happening around the role of automation, the role of robotics, the role of artificial intelligence in the workplace. And that, that is often a conversation that's sort of led by fearfulness of being replaced, et cetera. But it's really important to know that a base select committee um, inquiry a couple of years ago said, actually, we need more automation and more robotics and more artificial intelligence in our workplaces. And what we want to see at Tech UK is making sure that that um, new technology is not just reserved for the very largest businesses, but actually that wherever you are, whether you are in Leeds or Durham or in Cornwall, you can benefit from these new technologies. And I think the, the COVID crisis has really underlined the importance of digital. We've seen digital transformations that usually would take years and years and be incredibly painful for businesses to go through happen in a matter of weeks, not just in the, in the public sector where, for example, the NHS has moved very quickly to GPs consulting with um, patients online, but also in the private sector, as, as Karim mentioned, with businesses making use of digital marketplaces use of digital advertising for the first time to reach local communities. And, and we've seen the UK public respond to that um, by buying local and by supporting their high street, even through the economic shutdown. Um, but I, I think the minister is, is incredibly optimistic, I have to say, in terms of locking in these changes and, and actually moving forward to um, a new way of thinking and, and the, the the fact that you mentioned how important leadership styles and management styles were in this um, is really of note. Um, and, and we want to see that as well, but I think you know, we have to seize the moment and, and we'd look to government to support that happening. Um, and just to give you a very sort of sneak peek at some polling that Tech UK has um, commissioned, we're actually seeing a change in attitude. So we've seen 74% of the business leaders that we surveyed from a representative sample saying that actually they would be more dependent on technology moving forward. And a whopping eight out of 10 people saying that actually they wanted to improve their digital skills over the next 12 months. And we've seen the government enter that space for the first time. DFE's Digital Skills Toolkit, for example, saw hundreds of thousands of people taking online digital courses um, during the period when we were all stuck at home, whether we were on furlough or simply working from home and looking to 
upgrade our skills. So the really big question for us and, and what the CPS report does um, really well to, um, is actually sort of how do we lock in that progress that we've seen over the last few months and how do we build on it? How do we uh, build on the momentum around digital skills training and upskilling? How do we build on the momentum of um, businesses looking at digital uh, tools to increase their productivity, to uh, spark growth, etc. Um, and the, the CPS report makes a number of recommendations in this space. And really, I think one of the, the clearest things that comes through is how big players and small businesses form part of one same ecosystem. And by getting the regulatory landscape right for the big players, it helps them support small businesses and continue to support um, small businesses. I think there's a few other things that the government can do to make sure that we can continue Venus, to build on this. Sorry to cut in. Um, we, we'll get to what the government can do, if that's all right, during the q and I'll just give Absolutely. Nick, Nick Well, in that me. case, um, I will, in that case, but, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Is that all right? I promise I'll come back to you. Yeah, cause, yeah. Cause no, not a problem. Wants to know what, what the government might, how, how it might react to some of these recommendations. But Nick, like, and remember to get your questions in. We've got one in. Um, Nick, I'll come to you, please, just briefly. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Um, and on behalf of the CPS, I'd just like to um, thank officially the Minister, Paul Scully, for joining us today. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Um, and also congratulate Eamon on what I think is a, is a great report, really interesting, with some great, great insights. Um, I just want to briefly like, pick up on a couple of uh, interesting paradoxes, I think, within the research and why I think one of Eamon's recommendations uh, is particularly important. Um, and look at the polling and the focus group data. It backs up what I think a lot of us intuitively feel, which is that tech is a, a huge force for good. Uh, it's, it helps how we live our lives. It also helps a lot of businesses cope and grow. And the polling shown that SMEs think it helps them reach new audiences to compete, and more recently it's helped them specifically cope with COVID. Well, that's all great, but it does make me wonder about some of the wider trends which we see in the SME community, which, which almost seem to contradict that. So let me just focus on two, one of which Eamon's already mentioned. Um, First is this productivity paradox. And given the improvements we've seen in tech over recent years and how widespread tech adoption is, um, there's a big question as to why productivity has been flatlining in this country for a decade. And why, as this report shows, productivity in SMEs is particularly disappointing. Um, the second paradox I just want to mention briefly is why more and more companies complain about the burden of taxation and regulation despite the arrival of things like making tax digital, which have automated so much of the process. There's an easy answer to those two paradoxes, which is that there's still not enough tech being used. And if only more companies had access to more tech, they'd immediately become more productive and be able to deal with these things with a cinch. And I think there's an element of truth in that, but it's also, I think, too simplistic an answer. So I think there's um, two lessons that we can learn here. Um, the first is around tax and regulation. I think that whatever the tech solutions, it's clear to me that tax and regulation is still far too complicated for SMEs. We have a VAT system in this country with different thresholds, baffling reductions, exemptions in certain areas, and it just doesn't work for small businesses. We've got dual reporting structures for year-end results. We've got a vast array of reliefs, allowances, and tax credits, and we still largely re rely on accruals accounting rather than cash accounting, despite the fact that cash accounting is so much simpler for small companies. So, I mean, I could continue, but my central message is that the tax and regulation system in this country is just much too complicated for your average SME. So I'd urge the government to radically simplify tax for SMEs as a matter of urgency. And more generally, I'd urge the government to put SMEs first and foremost in their thinking. And I know uh, the minister is, is particularly keen on that and bangs the drum, but it's a message that the rest of government has to hear. And I'd urge the Treasury in particular to think about the burdens of, of, uh, that are felt by SMEs, with which, of course, technology can help. But there's a lesson for government as well. The second lesson is around productivity. And I think it's really interesting that productivity hasn't increased despite there being all this tech. And I draw at least two conclusions. First, as suggested earlier, there aren't enough companies using technology. And the polling showed that half of those polls think their businesses know how to make use of digital platforms, but it still leaves half who don't. And the minister talked us through some of the skills gaps earlier. And as for the 50% who say they do know how to use tech, well, they might be right, they might be wrong, but the figures suggest that not as many of them are right as we like to be. 
So I think there's a conclusion to be drawn that not enough companies are using the right sort of tech in the right sort of way. And that I think is where Eamon's recommendation about skills and training comes in. Eamon calls for flexibility around the apprenticeship levy and he suggests that tax breaks for people doing self-training should be looked at more closely. And I think that's just the sort of activity which, as the Minister has said, can help businesses pivot in the future. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks, Nick. Uh, and I forgot to say, Eamon, thanks, thanks for the report. It really is um, uh, well written and interesting stuff. Right. We've got a few questions that have come in. I'll just kick off with one to the Minister, if that's all right, and kind of leading on from what, what Nick was saying. What, how extensive should the role of government be in boosting the digital capabilities and skills of of small businesses and how much should it be down to the business owners and directors? Well, I talked a bit about the beginning about the fact that government doesn't create jobs, doesn't create wealth, uh, apart from, you know, when we're doing infrastructure projects, it's slightly different. But uh, but in terms of this, what we can do is set the the atmosphere, the, the ethos and give opportunities. And then, uh, then it's very much for, um, for others to take up the mantle. I think people tend to... Uh, like I, I've run small businesses and, and uh, I noticed one of the other questions about micro businesses. That was my world for 20 years, um, setting up businesses around my kitchen table, my uh, bedroom, like, you know, causing an office. So actually flexible working for me has not been much of an issue because it's just back to where I was before. So we can set the opportunity, but actually if you're going to get engaged people, as long as it's got government backing so that people can see a, a sort of benchmark of quality, then actually businesses tend to like to learn from other businesses. Um, people that have done, been there, done it, and got that expertise. Um, and uh, but on top, but having said that, what they don't want to do is to wade through necessarily a load of um, uh, risk of someone charging you this amount or that much. You know, not an eye for the main chance. And Cam talked about the number of businesses that are using Facebook's free products, and you can see clearly you can pay Facebook for, for additional products. But there's a wealth of free products out there that companies like Facebook provide for the right reasons. To because, as he says, when those small and micro businesses do well, Facebook does well. So it's a, it's a that's a the sort of partnership that we want to encourage. So government can only go so far, but definitely set the atmosphere and, and give those opportunities. Yeah, well, um, fingers crossed that that happens. Um, right, Venus, I, I'm conscious I cut you off. So uh, you were you were just sort of getting on to what what you think the industry from the, from the Tech UK um, would pick up from the report as as your yeah no, and, and I think actually the minister um, you know hit the nail on the head when he said about creating networks and actually badging something as as government backed. I think you know what government can do is lend credibility and confidence to individuals that this is a, a scheme that has um, that is high quality or um, actually acts as the, the sort of convener. And I think, you know, with the, the government's levelling up agenda, um, it's really about how can we empower LEPs and how can we empower uh, local networks to grow because businesses love to learn from each other. And, and big players like Facebook with their business resource centre, et cetera, provide a forum where um, businesses can learn from each other and where high quality advice and guidance um, is can be sort of distributed. And so seeing government um, at all levels act as um, a convener and, and as a sort of contributor to the discussion is, um, is something really positive and that we'd really like to see built on um, as part of the levelling up agenda. And while you're on, one, one of the questions that has come in, um, it's a pretty broad one, but... Uh, essential how do we ensure that people have the skills for the digital economy and my add to that is we all know we need it and we've all known we've needed it for a long time but but the, the skill shortage is huge how, how do we yeah the skill i mean the skill shortage is is really huge in the uk we we lose about 63 billion um, worth of gdp every year because of the digital skills gap and I think really as a nation, we need to get back to lifelong learning. And by that, I don't mean that we all now need to go and get a different degree or enroll in college, but actually how can we break down learning into that sort of something that is much more modular, something that we can do to fit in around our lives. Um, and like I said, I think, you know, the digital skills toolkit launched by the DFE and the digital boost campaign um, in Bayes are two really good examples of that, of, um, you know, really quick, courses we're talking two to three two to four weeks um, to give people the skills they need in in bite-sized chunks and as a nation we need to get back to um, learning in that format and and again it's about what can government do to 
you know, there's so much free training out there. Um, mm. But employers and prospective employees alike want to have the confidence to um, invest their resources and their time in that training. And so really having government back high quality courses that are free to access that are online is, um, is one way uh, that, you know, one avenue that the government could pursue. Thank you. Um, Karen, you, you, you touched on this in your, in your introduction, but um, keen to know what Facebook has done during lockdown with working with small businesses. How, how have you kind of, how's, how's what you've done changed, if at all, over the past three months or so? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so we've, um, and to, to the point about the, the sort of how, how do we get tech um, to um, using um, sort of small businesses using more tech, um, the, um, there's a, there's a sort of broader, like, there's a broader question about what do we mean by tech, which is essentially like small businesses use um, the tech that they understand, that they feel confident with, and that they and, 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 and that they they know is going to drive value for them. One, I was I was struck by some of the conversations, just some of the roundtables that that Eamon organised, where um, the, the, the 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 sort of fingers burn issue for small businesses of having invested in a tech product and spent time training your team and it not working was a real barrier. So what we've seen during the crisis is a, is 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 the, the businesses have, have not had a choice and they've they've latched on to um, products that they know understand that they feel confident with that they know that they can see that where the value is, is is driven and we can be hopeful that having adopted those those tools that, that, that they see the value and then they feel confident with them and they understand them and they don't go back to, to, to the way that we, things were before but we also had lots and lots of businesses that had already been using our technology because our technology is incredibly consumer facing it's incredibly basic actually in terms of what the the, the technology the technology required of, of somebody to use our tech our, our, our tools but we also knew that those businesses were finding things incredibly difficult for a whole range of other reasons so the first and most important thing was just getting them the information that they needed about government support about where they could access training and also how they could use our tools to help pivot their business and so that was a big priority for us that was a series of webinars but it was also our, our our business resource hub, which we literally showed to every business who opened their, their their Facebook account. We've also, as I said, accelerated some of our kind of commerce tools. So there's a lot of a kind of shift, as people have talked about, of moving beyond merely advertising and and and, and so on into building kind of online shops and tools and things like that that people that small businesses can do so we've accelerated a lot of that work and brought a lot of that forwards um, and we are also doing a, a listening exercise with the world bank and the oecd who are our long-term partners around data around small businesses and what people small businesses are telling us we publish the u.s data we're hoping to have the uk data uh, and data for for for, for, for other for, for, for other countries very soon and that's that's in a project with with, I say the World Bank and OECD to understand how the many businesses that are using our platform are, are, are dealing with the crisis. Um, but it's, yeah, it's been a case of, of getting the right information to people, helping them to pivot their business. Um, and, and, and the final thing I would say is this community thing, the peers thing. So one of the things that's going to come out of the Be The Business uh, partnership that we have is this, this set of business communities. So Facebook groups where businesses that have been through the initial webinars and trainings can get together and discuss and share ideas because that community of business people is something that we feel we can really offer uh, that's a bit unique to us great thank you um nick one for you um do you think there's an appreciation or an understanding of small businesses at the top end of government do you think there's enough of an understanding do you think do you think it needs to be higher up the agenda yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting question. And the, and the polling that we've done, um, both through through this particular bit of work, but also that we did as part of a just a wider range of piece of work looking at small business uh, a year or so ago called Think Small, shows that certainly the perception of small businesses themselves is that there isn't that sort of uh, understanding and recognition at the heart of government. I actually think the, the Boris Johnson administration um, is talk a pretty good game on SMEs. I think the sort of pillars upon which it is it is building its economic future, in particular around the levelling up agenda, 
and necessarily rely on successful small businesses. And I think there's a there's a real appetite to engage that goes right the way to the to the top and to the centre of government. And number ten is clearly mindful of the fact that uh, they will do well to hear more from the front line and people who are you know experiencing what it is like. But that does reflect as a, a wider phenomenon that I think has been going on for some time and is is natural enough in in some ways that it is easy for officials. It is relatively easy for the ministers and MPs, although I think they're less guilty of this because, you know, they all have constituency seats and they necessarily therefore deal with a lot of smaller businesses. But it's rel- it's it's understandably easier for officials, in particular seeing in the Department of Business, to engage with bigger businesses um, mm-hmm. and to engage a great deal with the CBI in particular um, and the IOD and the other business groups who tend to represent bigger business. And they are not, as you said in your introductory remarks, they're not the majority of business people in this country. 99.9% of businesses are SMEs, 99% are small businesses. And you know that is your average man or woman living in individual towns, villages, up and down the land, who need support and understanding for business. And as the minister said, you know, the government's not the wealth creator, but it does create the conditions And a lot of the time, I think there is a a failure to recognise and to put into place policy which supports those businesses as best they can. Yeah. Um, And coming back to the minister, please. And I think you've seen the question, but uh, effectively it's saying, do we not need a a minister for for micro businesses? Because their their needs are are slightly different to... They are, they are, uh, they, they are, and, uh, and frankly, I sort of, you know, small business um, rather than SME businesses in my job title, um, uh, um, but but I would include that in my. I know their 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 needs are different, and as I said before, I, I, I've been there, done that. So uh, so much of the support that we were uh, introducing at pace in in uh, the uh, beginning of the pandemic. Is stuff that can't you there, but there, but for the grace of God, you know, I've I've paid myself through dividends, so I do empathise with those people who've fallen through the cracks, those directors that we've not been able to support, um, and because we're using big uh, government initiatives like or big government structures to reverse engineer to try and help as many people as possible, but for for one man two man bands, as I say, working in their front room, it just it adds so much. Uh, um stress on them uh that that we do need to look at the technology uptake for for them because they they just spend so much time working on the uh, you know for their business they don't spend enough time working on their business and that is digital uptake as well as uh sort of forward planning and resilience planning and these kind of things so i'm more than happy to to encapsulate that in my role uh, and in a in a way that actually anyone comes after me that hasn't necessarily had my uh, direct involvement in micro business can uh, can can it can be embedded in their portfolio as well. Yeah, watch this space, um, Eamon, uh, Just a quick one for you, if that's all right. Um, one stat that jumped out was the twenty two percent still that are not using any digital platform. What, any any thoughts from the polling as to why they're not? Is it they're just not aware they're not they're a bit scared i don't know but yeah it, it's a good question and one which kind of made us scratch our heads um a little ourselves and i think one of the things that could come out is that actually some of them are but they don't necessarily know that they are um and i mean that in itself is perhaps an interesting finding and something that warrants um further consideration about sort of um the extent to which business is actually kind of engaging actively on this agenda and you know, maybe if they did know um, uh, what some of the benefits could be of digitization, they would uh, engage in it a lot more. So I think talking to, to groups like Be The Business, um, who we engaged with uh, during this research, I think I was very, um, very impressed with sort of the programs they're, they're doing and definitely seem to be kind of reaching out to those businesses, and actually kind of breaking it down and showing, you know, if you uh, maybe invest in, say, digital accounting software, you're going to save time, you're going to be able to concentrate on generating more leads and probably doing the sort of work which you actually find more rewarding. Um, so I think so I think that's definitely uh, something which came out which um, was particularly interesting. Um, and yeah, but doubtlessly there probably are some businesses that, that just aren't um, capturing these benefits of digitization. And so it's a, a real question for, um, you know, how can businesses like Facebook, um, the government, how can they kind of work together to, to really engage those businesses in 
in the digital uh, economy and a lot more in a way which evidently isn't happening at the moment. Can I, can I just say, Peter, do you mind? It's just was be, be the Business has been mentioned a few times now, and it's a really good example of what we were talking about earlier. It's government funded, it's set up by business people, delivering business to business advice, mentoring, support, and these kind of things. So it's the trust factor that I was talking about with the, with, with the backing, the full backing of government, and it's that kind of partnership working that, that um, is effective, and we can do a lot more to, to build on that. Yeah, and um, but I think it's a positive move that the CBI now has Tony Danker as there. Yeah, yes, he gets it. He totally gets it, doesn't he? So, fingers crossed um, that works well. Um, yeah, Karen, just moving on from what Eamon was talking about, uh, and is there any element of, of mistrust among business owners when when it comes to talking to Facebook? We had a question on data, but um, there, there might be other. Uh, uh, there might be other elements and if so what do you what do you say to them when they, when they have those misgivings um of course um you know this is there's a, there's a number of different ways in which people might um look at a, a larger business um as a small business and 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 might well um be wary of of, of working with them um and and that can be um, magnified when it's new technology, it can be magnified when there is, um, in some cases, legitimate public criticism of some of the things that have happened with our with our um, business over the years. Um, and that you know that 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 barrier is a real one. Um, and uh, I you know that the people will, in terms of the, the the trust that we might we might build up, and we we're really conscious of that, and we work incredibly hard to, um, for example, on on on, on content. Um, we, we invest a huge amount of 35,000 people now working on safety and security issues at Facebook to tackle uh, some of the, the negative content that you might see online, for example, as, as, one, as one thing like that. Um, but also really good uh, regulatory frameworks can help do that. So if you look at something like GDPR, uh, the questioner was asking around data, you know, the, 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 the responsibilities on us, the responsibilities on the businesses that are using us, uh, using our platform are really, really clear because there's a regulatory framework there that allows uh, that partnership and a shared understanding of the, of the framework and that's why we've been really open to some of the regulatory ideas coming out of government on, on some of the broader issues as well because we understand that value that that a, 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 a framework as the minister talks about um, whereby you create the space for businesses to thrive by having a sensible and coherent regulatory framework uh, can be really, really important. And we, we, you know, we we want trust, openness, transparency in what we do. Um, so we've been last two and a half years been publishing transparency reports on our content activities, for example, um, which has been really, really valuable in, in in having that dialogue. But again, you know, we, we recognise that people aren't always comfortable with us marking our own homework. So that that regulatory framework is really, really important. Thank you. Um, a, a question from Chris Hewlett, who uh, was one of the founders of, of Octopus, which is one of our sort of uh, most exciting scale up businesses in Britain. Um, uh, for, for the minister, what, are there any specific policies you can point to t that would make it easier for people to set up businesses as we sort of enter coronavirus recovery mode in the economy? Yeah, I mean, it, already in terms of uh, just opening, simply opening a business is is one of the easiest um, countries in the world to, to, to do so. But um, further than that, I think we need to work with, um, it's, it's, it's easier access to finance, easier access to, to, to that startup support as well. Um, because how did, you know, when I set up businesses, um, these small businesses, I didn't really look to government, I didn't look to my local authority. Um, it was not networks, but it was actually through my, if I needed advice, I'd probably sort it, look for it myself or it'd be through a bank accountant and that sort of, that traditional path. But we've, um, it's, it's really developing the growth hubs um, uh, to make sure that uh, the support and encouragement can, can, can come through there. As I say, absolutely consistent around the, around the country, um, rather than necessarily policies to make it easier but nick was uh, talking uh, right at the beginning about tax simplification 
uh, clearly it's just making it easier to understand bureaucracy, not just the forms to set up a company and company house requirements, but actually how do you do a VAT return? How do you, mm-hmm. uh, 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 that puzzled, got me puzzled for, for many, many years, frankly, well, as, as I was doing it. It's getting that, that stuff easier. Making tax digital is one, one of those areas, but if we can simplify the structures behind it as well, not only does it make it easy for those business, those um, startups, but it also turns accountants from wealth protectors into wealth creators as well. They can work next to you to help you grow your business rather than how to, how to get around this bit of bureaucracy or to fill in this form and those kind of things. And a follow on um, to that, do you think there should be different levels of support in different parts of the country? I think it's different focus. So you, the, the, you, clearly regional support um, is required. So you need localized solution. Um, so what, you know, what happens in Manchester, I was in Manchester a few months ago, they've got an amazing uh, uh, creative scene there. Um, uh, it's, it's the business community is a little bit closer because it's a smaller, smaller city than say London, but you've got pockets of, 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 of work in, in London, but, but it's definitely regional solutions that we need. So it's, um, you know, whether it's automotive in the Midlands or an aerospace around the country, you've got a, a construction in, in different areas. We need to make sure that we, we, we're supporting different sectors in certain, certain, in certain places um but with a level of consistency that's that's um uh that's there throughout the country are the growth hubs and the leps really the answer they, they seem to have had a lot of chances well as i say you know this is something that frankly i you know i came in in february march and there'd been a lockdown like this but it's the it's the thing that i identify quite correctly that i want to make sure there's a, a there's some really good examples of growth hubs there's a, there's areas that uh, there's others i've heard about not managed to get to yet that that uh, you know there's there's stuff there's more stuff we do so we need to make sure that we share in a practice uh, best practice but still allowing them the local solutions those regional solutions that i talked about yes that makes a lot of sense um right we're running out of time um thanks everyone if there are any very quick closing remarks from any of the panelists we can take them for 30 seconds or so otherwise uh right it just I think, no, uh, it just remains for me to say thank you very much to all our panellists, thanks to the Small Business Minister, Paul Scully. Um, yeah, a, a really fascinating, timely report that I, I think, um, crucially, unlike some of these reports, actually has a lot of action points that, that can be worked on. So um, it would be good to see some of those, some of those happening, particularly on productivity and, um, and levelling up help for the regions, um, which are going to be so essential in the next few months and years. Uh, Thank you everyone for dialing in and um, we'll uh, see you again soon. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Cool, well done. See you. Oh, okay, it's gone. Right, thanks very much guys.